Welcome to the channel, everybody. This is Each One Reach One. I pray and hope that you guys have been well, all right, and that this lesson reaches you and that you are benefited and added to in some way via the power of the word, which comes via the Holy Spirit, which comes via our King, Yahweh Shai, which comes via our Father, Yahweh. Thank you guys for joining me today. Let's have a walk in righteousness. The goal is to help turn many to righteousness who have gone the way of unrighteousness and those who seek after their own righteousness instead of the righteousness that which comes through our Messiah by way of our, I mean, by uh, commandment and will of our Father. All right, so let's give all praise, honor, and glory to the highest, to our Father, Yahweh, in the name of the beloved, our King, Savior, and Redeemer, Yahweh Shai the reason for the season. All right. So we are here today because as usual, you know, there are many things that are persistent among our people of Israel that need to be checked. It need to be spoken about in order to get people to turn from the crooked paths that they have found themselves on now. And so, you know, a lot of times things will, things will be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Things will be uh, repetitive. Yeah, things will be repetitive. You will hear certain topics and certain things being discussed quite often because they need to be. All right, so this is not going to be like a groundbreaking study or anything of that nature. This is just going to be me helping to bring people into remembrance of things that actually are and things that actually have been and to hopefully get someone who has never seen these things before in the scriptures to be able to open their eyes and to see them now. Again, there aren't earth shattering or, or groundbreaking. You know, this all should be common knowledge to many who are um walking in the spirit, you know, but many are babes in this truth and babes in their walk with the Holy Spirit. And some may need this video. This may be their first encounter with the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, I pray that I do the, the lesson justice and that the most high gives me utterance that allows me to, to accomplish what he has pushed me to accomplish with this lesson. All right. So many now, as I've always been, have a zeal for the most high, but it's not according to knowledge though. You know, we we kind of make up God and, and paint him in our own image, right? In our own likeness. We try to make him be what we are or what we imagine or what we what we desire instead of taking him for who he is, listening to who he tells us he is and 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 tell listening to him tell us how he likes to be loved, how he wants to be respected, how he wants to be obeyed. And we instead try to redefine obedience and, and so forth and righteousness and do things our way. If you are in a relationship with anybody, it's very, you have to be very careful because it's very important in order for you to understand that person as an individual, because you got to treat people as individuals. What was Great with one woman may not be great with the next. What one man enjoyed, the next man might hate and so forth, right? And so you can't be one of those people who say, well, my love language is blank. And so I'm just going to do blank. But the person you're with may not like blank. They might not, they might like blankety blank. And if you say, I'm not doing blankety blank, I'm doing blank instead, then you can expect that relationship to sour, to not go the way that you would like it to go because you have made a conscious decision to ignore what they told you they wanted, what they told you they desire in favor of doing your own thing in the same way as with the most high. Why would we think that it would be any different? He constantly tells us who he is and we try to change him. We try to make him be what we want him to be. He tells us how to love him and we try to love him the way we want to. He tells us how to respect him, how to obey him. And we try to do it how we want to do it. And that is unacceptable. So again, the question is your zeal for the most high according to knowledge. Many of you will have to answer no if you're answering honestly. And if your answer to that honestly is no, that's great because one of the first steps in righteousness is honesty, is truth. You got to come to grips with the truth. 
right? The Holy Spirit is the, the spirit that brings you into all truth, not the spirit that keeps you in delusions and all lies. All right. So let's get the truth. All right. Now we are going to speak to different sects of people. The Old Testament only Israelites who don't believe in the Messiah and those who do believe in the Messiah, but they are what we call the lukewarm Israelites. They are fence straddlers. All right. You got to choose a side. You can't be lukewarm. He rather you be cold rather than be lukewarm. So we're going to start in Romans 10. All right, this is a good place to springboard. Verse one, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to the Father for Israel is that they might be saved. And this is great because my sentiment is the same. That is the reason for me doing this video. I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't have a great desire in my heart for Israel to be saved, if I didn't have a great love for my people. I can just do Bible study with my own children or my own household and only care about those of my own household and leave it at that. But because I have a burning in my spirit, because I love the children of my father, I have a, a, a desire for my people to see my people in the kingdom and for us to, to, to together come into his kingdom and to the fulfillment of all things that he's promised. All right, so brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to our father for you, Israel, is that you might be saved. All right, continuing. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of our power, but not according to knowledge. All right? And so nothing new under the sun. What was true in Paul's time when he wrote this and spoke this is true in our time now as I speak this and record this. All right? Many in Israel have a zeal for the Most High, but it is not according to knowledge for they being ignorant of our powers righteousness and that's what it is they are ignorant of our powers righteousness and so they go about to establish their own righteousness they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of our god all right and what is that what is well let's continue for mashiach is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. He is the end of the law for righteousness. What do you mean? The end of what law? And this is where you have to, you know, you have to be careful and you have to nitpick through the truth because the truth is that the law can have different connotations. So you have to use context clues in order to understand which way is applicable from moment to moment. Now, the law could, could be a reference to the Torah. It could be a reference to the law of Moses. Or it could be a reference to the Ten Commandments. All right. So when it's talking about how Christ Mashiach is an end of the law for righteousness, what law is being spoken of here? Well, it is the law of Moses. All right. It is not the Torah. It is not the Ten Commandments. And we know this when we because we read the New Testament and he touts the Ten Commandments and he pushes the Ten Commandments. All right. And he says that he did not come to do away with the law. What a law was he talking about? He wasn't talking about the law of Moses because he did come to do away with the law of Moses. That's why he kept talking against the law of Moses. The law he was speaking about was the Torah, meaning the law, the prophets. All right. He did not come to do away with, with what everything the prophets said must come to be. He came to fulfill everything that the prophet said must be. That is a, dig, a direct strike at one of the main tenets and doctrines of Christianity. All right. So the law that he was speaking of here in verse four is the law of Moses. All right. So anyone telling you that the law of Moses is still in effect, again, they fit this this verse here, these, these scriptures here, they have a, a zeal for the most high God, but it is not according to knowledge. You know, they have went into the Old Testament, learned their history and decided, oh, I better keep the law of Moses because the Israelites of old got in trouble for not abiding by the law of Moses. And so, you know, I better abide by it. Not realizing that what King Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes was true, that for everything, there is a time and a season, all right? And the time for the law of Moses has passed. And the proof that it has passed is the fact that 
We have no Levitical priesthood. We have none of the things that we needed under the law of Moses. In order to accomplish the law of Moses, we needed we needed certain things, and those certain things are not in existence. That is our Father's way of letting us know that that is done away with. We are past that time period where he wants us under the law of Moses. All right, but we are still under the royal law, the law of the king, the law of our father, the law of, of our master, Yahweh Shai. We are under the Ten Commandments, no doubt about it. All right, so let's proceed to, let's, okay, um, verse five, I didn't get verse five. For Moses describeth the righteousness, which is of the law that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. So again, it's a, this is a reference to the law of Moses. All right, he's making it clear so that, you know, there is no argument or debate here. All right, so we can't, we don't need to strive over this, this, uh, this point because the scriptures make it clear. It's not vague. So let's move to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 15. Our king says, if you love me, keep my commandments. All right. So this is for the fence straddlers, the lukewarm Israelites. All right. You believe in Christ. You believe in the Messiah, Yahweh Shai, but you also believe that the law of Moses is still in effect. All right. That you're still under the law of Moses. All right. He's telling you, if you love me, keep my commandments. He never says keep the law of Moses. I dare you to go anywhere in the New Testament and find where he tells you to keep the law of Moses. He doesn't. He's speaking expressly against the law of Moses constantly throughout the New Testament. And this is the reason why many Old Testament only Israelites don't believe in the New Testament because they can't believe that, you know, we were told to keep the law of Moses all throughout the Old Testament, but then the New Testament comes around and he's saying, Throughout the law of Moses. Now, that's in direct conflict with, with the Old Testament. Uh-oh, we have a problem. That means we have to throw away the New Testament because it conflicts with the New Testament because it says throw away the law of Moses. But see, again, they have a zeal for the Most High, but not according to knowledge. They have no knowledge of the fact that there was a time and a season for the law of Moses. That even in the, in the Old Testament, the law of Moses was always uh, predicted and foretold that it would have its end, but they can't, they can't see it, even though it's constantly there throughout the entire Old Testament. All right. So your king says, if you love me, keep my commandments. All right. Let's go to chapter 15 and let's get verse 10. He says, if you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. He didn't say if you keep the law of Moses, right? He said, if you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. You see, there is, there is the Messiah giving honor and respect and reverence to the father, his head, not trying to sit in the place of the father, not trying to replace the father, not making himself above the father. Like many Old Testament only Israelites tell you he's doing throughout the the New Testament, see, it's like they haven't read it, but they're reading it and they're not understanding the New Testament. They're not understanding what they're reading because they are without the Holy Spirit. They have been left in the darkness. He doesn't want them to understand. And you have to be given permission for him to understand. He has to unlock your understanding. He has to turn on the light for you in order for you to be able to see in the darkness. Otherwise, you will remain there. All right, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter five. But again, we're going to keep building and we're going to prove this thing, right? Prove all things. I'm not just going to make statements. We're going to prove all things via the scriptures. And again, if you are an Old Testament only Israelite and you're here, don't just sit here, you know, scoffing and mocking. Listen, pay attention, follow, either follow on the screen or whip out your Bible. And follow for yourself and see where you end up at the end of things. Hear the conclusion of the matter before you speak against it. All right. Deuteronomy 5 and 29. Oh, that there were such a heart in them, Israel, that they would fear me and keep 
all my commandments always that it might be well with them and with their children forever. So what was the most high sentiment here? His desire was that there will be a heart in his people to fear him and keep all his commandments always. All his commandments always. He's not talking about the law of Moses. He is talking about the Ten Commandments, which he gave to Moses in the beginning. All right. When he brought the, our, our, the, the children of Israel out and Moses went up the mountain. That's what he's talking about. The Ten Commandments. All right. So let's go to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22 and 35. 22 and 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? The great commandment in the law, not the law of Moses, in the Torah. Law here is a reference to the Torah, which is the great commandment in the Torah. Yahweh Shai said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. He immediately pointed him to the Ten Commandments. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Again, He's pointing to the Ten Commandments, and then he summarizes it. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Why is he saying on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets? He's talking about Torah when he says law here. It's because everything that he was pushing on us and that he wanted us to keep throughout the Torah, it was all about the Ten Commandments. It wasn't the law of Moses. The law of Moses was getting our people in trouble time and time again. That's why it was necessary for Christ to come and nail the law of Moses to the Christ, to, well, to the Christ, to the cross and take it out of the way because it, the law of Moses, was the stumbling block that was causing us to stumble and to not be worthy of salvation. So he removed what was tripping us up so that he can allow us a clean path to him. All right. So again, let's go to Genesis because I know the, the Old Testament on the Israelites are they're 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 anxious right now. They're they're hating me, they're angry and they're they're wishing that they could chime in and tell me how horrible and 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 useless the new testament is well let's go to the old testament then all right and let's just see what's going on in the old testament because you old testament only israelites you don't understand the old testament how do i know you don't understand the old testament because you're an old testament only israelite being an old testament only israelite is the proof all the proof that we need that you don't understand the old testament because the entire old testament speaks of christ you, He's either being spoken of or he is doing the speaking or he is doing the works that you have no idea he's doing because you're attributing everything to the father, which you're not wrong, but you are wrong. See, you can be wrong and right at the same time. You're wrong because you think that it's the father himself physically and actively doing the works. He is not. It is the father's will, the father's, com father's commandment for these things to be done, but it is his son executing them. And there, there are times where his son would delegate. See, it's the hierarchy, the, the art of delegation. Like in most corporations and, and well-run businesses, there will be a hierarchy and delegation will be in full effect. You will have a CEO and, you know, you have people beneath him and you have the different sections and supervisors and people beneath them. And this is how it goes in heaven. The pattern of things in the earth is being made after the pattern of things in heaven. You have the father who is the, the top of the hierarchy, the top of the chain. And then you have his foreman, so to speak, his first begotten, his only begotten son, Yahweh Shai, under him, who he gives commandment to, who he tells what he wants done, and he goes to get it done. What are you reading when you read Genesis and you read in the beginning, God, Elohim, 
created the heaven and the earth. When you look into the interlinear, you see that God is plural. So it's multiple gods. Hmm. But I've heard it said, I heard the argument from someone say that, no, see, it's talking about the, the, the royal, the royal court of angels, the royal court of angels. No, but you must prove all things. Where in the Bible does it say that? And so, you know, we can go into the interlinear and we can look where it says God. And again, remember, you got to use context. Remember what we just went over about how you can see where it says the law and you have to decide in that instance, what does the law point to? Same thing here. All right. So in God, it says rulers or judges, the angels were never at any time said to be the judges or rulers. Right. Divine ones, angels, gods, plural, right. Plural intensives, singular meaning, right? And so we understand that it's speaking about gods here, plural. And you say, well, what if it is speaking about angels, though? It could be speaking about angels because the angels could be rulers because the Mosai gave different angels, you know, different rules over, you know, different people groups and so forth. We go into the, the context. We go into context then. Okay, well, if that's going to be your stance, well, then let context be the tiebreaker. All right? Let it be the tiebreaker. So let's get context now. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Listen, and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Wait a minute. The spirit of God. So we know that God is plural, but it says the spirit, not the spirits, the spirit. So that means these plural gods share one spirit. In order to share this spirit, they must be together, right? They are one, two different individuals. I'm saying, you see, individuals in air quotes for you know, lack of a different way to put it, because this is all for you to be able to understand. Two different entities, two different individuals, but they share of one same spirit. Hmm. The father created the angels as messengers to do a work for him, but they at never at any point were given of the great gift of sharing the spirit of the father. OK. They were never called his his children. They are made ministers for those of us who would inherit the kingdom. Ministering spirits. All right. Servants. All right. Respectfully. Respectfully. So. All right. But again, we're going to build upon this. We're not going to stop there. All right. So we're going to go from here. Let's go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 30. It says, I and my father are one. All right. This is Yahweh Shai. This is our Messiah saying, I and my father are one. And so now those who are without the Holy Spirit, you know, they get flustered here. They can't understand what he means. They are of one spirit. They are on one accord. They are on the exact same page. They have one mind, one spirit, one accord, one mission, one will. I and my father are one. Hmm, that sounds like multiple gods that share the same spirit. All right. But I know you're saying, see, that's the new, it's the new Testament. And see, he's saying that he's on par with God. See, it's the same spirit of the Pharisees that wanted to kill him because he's making himself equal to God. Off with his head. All right. Again, you're proving that you are of your father, the devil. You have no ability to understand spiritual matters. You are completely carnal in your thinking. 
you can't understand spiritual things. All right, John chapter 17, verse 11. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world and I come to thee. See, he's, he's speaking to the father, all right? Because they are two different entities, but they are of the same spirit. Holy father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me that they may be one as we are. They may be one. How is a bunch of different fleshly men going to all be one? Hmm. What does he mean by that? They're going to be on the same page. They're going to be on the same accord. They're going to have the same desire, right? The same hope, the same faith, right? And then when they come into the body, they will become one person, the same way both kingdoms of Israel were, were foretold that we would no longer be two separate kingdoms, that we will become one kingdom again. We will become one stick in our master's hand and no longer two. He will make of the twain one kingdom. Are you following me? All right. So let's keep it going. Again, we're going to go back to the Old Testament to bring it all home, to, to tie a bow around this thing. But I'm going to bounce back and forth to show you where your errors are in reading the scriptures. All right. So now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Because when we join unto him, we become one spirit with him. All right? We are different people, but we are of one spirit. All right? Because we are the sons and daughters of God. We are the ones predestined to be part of his family, right? To share of his spirit, not the angels, us. But before there will be many children that share of his spirit, there was one that shared of his spirit first. And through him, we would all be given a highway to the father to become like him to be joined unto the father like him. He was the example of what was possible. He was the demonstration of our father to show us what is possible so that we can hope in it. He knows that we needed to see it, right? And it, we need to have an example of it happening in order to know that it's possible. For example, in the days of Noah, no one believed it outside of Noah's family what he was saying was coming while he was building the ark. He was prophesying. He was preaching. He was telling, he was warning people. He was sounding the alarm of what was to come. But at that time, rain had never came upon the earth before. So no one could believe what he said. They would have to have had faith in what he said. That's why, like the Bible says, in the end would be like the days of Noah. We are in the time of faith. We aren't in the time where we got to see Christ in all his works. So we have to have faith, all right? We have to have faith, unlike the faith or the lack of faith that those who were destroyed by the flood had in the time of Noah, right? We have to believe that these things that we have never seen are possible but we have a record of what has been and we have to have make a decision to believe what we read we have to believe the record right but only those who are given the holy spirit and that the father draws to himself will believe those who he does not want to come to him they will not believe so that they can't come to him because he wants them to stay far from him all right now, let's move to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we are going to get verse 13. And it says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, the body of Christ, 
by one spirit are we all baptized into one body by the Holy Spirit, right? Are we all baptized into one body? Because those that he loves, he shares his Holy Spirit with. He fills us with his spirit and he draws us via his spirit towards himself. He makes us of one spirit with himself. All right. Whether we be bond or free and and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. All right? And so you're supposed to get in your head this idea of oneness with the Father, that you can be, it can be many of us, but we're all one though. If we're all part of his body, we're all part of his family, we are one with him. Right. In the same way that all of the apples on the apple tree is one with the entire tree, so long as it is they are attached to the tree. No, the apples aren't the branches. No, they aren't the trunk of the tree. Right. But they are still part of the tree. They are one with the tree. It doesn't take away from the tree if you say that apples are part of the tree. All right, let's go to Ephesians chapter two. Ephesians chapter two, verse 18. For through him, Yahweh Shai, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. All right, so hammering home this idea of one spirit and oneness with the Father. We are all being drawn into oneness with the Father. But there is already one in heaven who is already ex experiencing and enjoying oneness with the Father. And it doesn't take away from the Father's glory, from the Father's majesty, or the Father's power. All right. Let's go to um, Ephesians chapter four, verse four. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Let's back, I'm sorry, I, I went right to verse five. What the heck is wrong with me? There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. All right, matter of fact, let's back up to verse three. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Being of the spirit brings unity. It unites us to the Father. It unites us to our Messiah, to Yahweh Shad. There is one body and one spirit because once we be joined unto him, we become one body. We are many members of one body. All right? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. All right. All right. So Philippians chapter one, verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Mashiach, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. All right, so we're hammering home this sense of oneness, one spirit, one mind, one body, on the same accord with our power, being many different people, but one with our God, so that you can see that this is possible all right, if you don't believe this is possible, then what are you even doing? Even as an Old Testament only Israelite, do you believe that we are his children? If you believe that we are his children, do you believe that we are, that he, his plan is to draw us into oneness with himself? If you believe that we are going to inherit the kingdom and that he is bringing us into oneness with himself, one family of one spirit, then how is it hard 
or impossible for you to believe that before it could be many of us that that there was one of us. There was one before many. How is it so difficult for you to comprehend? All right, now let's go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter one. All right, Genesis chapter one, verse 26. And Elohim said, let us make man in our image. And so again, again, I heard the brothers teach and say that this was the angels. So the angels decided that they were gonna make men in their image. What? So you mean to tell me angels were given the ability to make man in their image, but there couldn't be a son of God that was given the ability to make man in the image of him and our father? You see the way they cherry pick and pick and choose what they want to believe? See, they rather believe that there are these angels out here with all this power to do these different things, but there could not be a Messiah, the firstborn of a father who he calls his son that does these things. It's crazy. So they believe these things can be done, just not by Yahweh Shah, just not by our king. Just, just angels doing it. You know? So it, it, it destroys their but God will not give his glory unto another argument. But, you know, whatever. They they are wildly inconsistent in their arguments and in their, in their stance because, you know, lacking the truth makes you un unstable. It makes you unstable. It will give you instability. All right? Okay, so Genesis chapter uh, 26, again, to continue. And the Most High said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now, what people don't understand is that this is a prophecy of what's going to happen at the end of the 6,000 years of human creation. That we are, we have been, we have been a work in progress. Since the beginning until now, the Most High took 6,000 years to create us in his image, to make us like him. All right? Remember, on the sixth day is when man were created, right? And it's the 6,000 year, that's the sixth day because of, uh, a 1,000 years is as a day to the Most High, right? So the 6,000 year is the same as day six of creation. See, it was a prophecy. It was him telling us beforehand what he would do. He was prophesying and telling us what would be, right? He was telling us the end from the beginning. See what's going on here? Telling us the end from the beginning. So we have been under construction as a people being made in his likeness. Creation after creation, because regeneration is a real thing. He's been working on us for multiple lifetimes, whether you can dig it or not. All right? You should dig into the scriptures if you don't believe that. All right? But that's not what this lesson is for in particular. All right? So God created man in his own image. Remember, God is plural, but it says his, not in there, in his so this plural God is referring to himself as one person, as one. He's never ever claimed to be one with the angels. But the Bible does tell us about him being one with Christ, about him being one with Yahweh Shai, one with the word of God. All right. So Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai created man in his own image, in the image of God created he, him, male and female created he, them. See, this is why people get confused when they read this and say, well, wait a minute. It says he created male and female together, but then it says that he created Adam. I don't understand. See, this is crazy. And why you don't understand is because you don't understand that this is prophecy about the end. He was telling us what he would do through creation. This isn't talking about literally in the beginning when he when he created 
when he put Adam here, this is talking about us at the end of things over his 6,000 year uh, period. He has been perfecting men and women, creating us in his image over 6,000 years, AKA six days. In the sixth day, we will be created. We will be made as him. We have not made it there yet. But when the sixth day come, we will be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Right? Okay. And they were given dominion over the earth that is to come. And they were told to replenish the earth. See, Adam didn't need to replenish the earth. Adam and Eve didn't need to replenish the earth. Adam and Eve weren't given a directive to replenish the earth. They were told to keep the garden. See, because this is end time prophecy. When Israel, after he destroys many nations, Babylon and all these nations that took us captive, and he reduces greatly reduces the population of the earth, and the earth has been scorched and destroyed, something terrible, we're going to be given commandment to replenish the earth to be fruitful and multiply, to have dominion over everything. This is to come. But again, the ultimate point is the God here is Yahweh Shai, Christ, and the Father. They are the gods, the plural, who are one, who are working together. Christ working on behalf of the Father. The Father says, this is what I, what, this is what I want to do. His son gets it done. Father sits on his throne and doesn't move. He is almighty. He is the majesty on high. He delegates, man. <laughs> he points, he says, do this, do that, right? Remember how when the centurion came and, you know, he, he was trying to get healing for his servant. And he told Yahweh Shai, no, 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 don't come to my house. I'm not worthy, but I'm a man under authority. I tell one, do this and do that, and they do it. So all you got to do is give the word. And he says, I have not seen such great faith. No, not in Israel. See, he was so impressed by it, and it made an impact on him because he was like, this man understands heavenly things. He understands the, the idea of hierarchy. See, because this is the way I work with my father. The father tells me, go do this, go do that, and I go and get it done. The father doesn't need to go here and go there. He just needs to give the commandment, and it gets done. The centurion understood hierarchy, right? Giving commands and giving orders, and then someone, you have people beneath you that go and execute your orders. But you missed it, though, right? Okay. I get it. Let's go to Genesis chapter two, verse 15. And so in Genesis chapter two, again, it's by the creation of man and woman. So everything is being created, right? So because remember in chapter one, it's the prophecy. He's telling us the end from the beginning. And in chapter two, he, he does the things that he said he was going to do. Now he starts to do it. All right. Remember, and uh, Amos, it says the Messiah doesn't do anything unless he first declares it by his prophets. I'm paraphrasing. He does nothing except he, he declares it via his prophets first. First. So he declared it. He spoke it. He said what he was going to do. And then now in chapter two, he's doing it. All right. And so now we come down to chapter, I'm sorry, not chapter, to verse 15. And in verse 15, it says, and the Lord God took the man, Adam, and put him in into the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. So he wasn't in the garden at first, but he's been put into the garden. Why? Because he's he has all of the earth is created, but now Eve, Eden is this paradise. He created Adam to be in paradise and to rule over all his creation from paradise. This is a symbol of things to come, like Israelites being in New Jerusalem, but ruling over the earth from New Jerusalem, which will be above the earth, right? But in the earth, you get it? You don't understand that the Bible is giving us shadows of things to come. We are constantly being given prophecies and shadows 
of things to come, examples of things to come. He teaches us of heavenly things via earthly things first, and then he gives us spiritual understanding. Right? People will say, as above, so below, uh, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, because first things happen in heaven and then they happen in earth. And the pattern of things on the earth is after the pattern of things in the heavens. You follow? And he tries to illustrate and gets us to see the pattern of things in the heaven by giving us an example of them on the earth. He foreshadows things that are to come. But many read the Bible and they don't quite understand this. That's why they couldn't see Christ being foreshadowed constantly through the scriptures. His reign being foreshadowed. His coming in, in flesh and dying and everything that he would accomplish being foreshadowed. They couldn't see it. They can't see it. They are blinded. All right? So, uh, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help me for him. Stop. What this is explaining to us is creation. Think, um, listen, listen. All right. He gets us to understand heavenly things via earthly things. Now, the firstborn of the father in heaven was Yahweh Shad. The firstborn of, of the father on earth is Adam. Adam was created by himself. And then the father said, it is not good that he should be alone. I'm going to make help meets for him. He made a woman. Christ was made by himself first in heaven. And the father said, it's not good that my son should be alone. I will make helpers for him. And then that's when the elect of God were created, who we call the body of Christ, were created spirits in the beginning after him. Right? So that's the woman. Keep all of these similitudes and things in your head. That's the woman. All right. We were like Eve being created for Adam. We were being created for him. All right. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called them, every living creature, that was the name thereof. And so remember, Yahweh Shai, he created everything and he named everything in heaven, all right? And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found to help me for him. The Most High, he created uh, angels and, and these different other creatures and entities and so forth, but none of them were fitting help meets for Christ, for Yahweh Shai. So the elect had to be created. All right. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh, flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. We were taken out from Christ. He was the life right in him was, was, the, was the life of men. Right. Us. We were taken out of him. We were a part of him and we were taken from him, right? And now we're being brought to him from the father in the same way that the woman was brought to Adam. You dig it? All right. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Not literally one flesh. The same way we are not literally, you know, one flesh with Christ, but we are one flesh with him in the spiritual sense. We are of one body. We are the body of Christ. In the same way, a man and a woman become one. All right? Same thing. All right. You got to get these things through your head. All right. So let's go to 
Genesis chapter three, come down to verse seven. This is all about the fall of man, right? Verse seven, and the eyes of them both were opened. All right, so they've fallen. They've done the, the thing that they shouldn't have done. And they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Follow this. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Stop. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. Wait a minute. How can someone's voice walk? You got to use context. Spiritual lenses, put them on. This must mean that the voice is a person, is an entity, something capable of movement. This is not our father's literal voice, okay? And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They hung, they hid themselves from, from what? From who? The presence of the Lord God. This is Yahweh Shai. This is Christ in the beginning. This is him walking into the garden. He is the voice of the Father. He is the presence of the Father, meaning he is the image of the Father. He is the Father in the flesh. We, we know what the Father looks like when we see him. He comes on behalf of the Father. He is like the Father's avatar. All right? And we, once we become one with him, we will become his other avatars. He has one, and then he will have many, which is his desire to have many, that he will rule over the earth through us. He will inhabit us and dwell in us the way he inhabits Christ and dwells in him and uses him to do many mighty great works. He will be he will use us in the self-same way. All right. He says, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice. I didn't hear you. I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. This is Christ. This is Yahweh Shai. And those with, with spiritual understanding, you can see it. Some of you might be seeing it for the first time, but others, you know, you know this already. So this is nothing new, right? And so again, let's go to John chapter one. See, those without spiritual understanding, spiritual insight, they can't, they can't see these things. They missed it. So when you come to John chapter one, they're like, yeah, right. That's crazy because they couldn't understand the Old Testament. So they're not going to understand the New Testament at all. Just is the way it is. In the beginning was the word, aka the voice of the father. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Because Christ Yahweh was shy. He was with the Father. He was the voice of the Father. He's the one who spoke on the Father's behalf, right? He did the talking. He did the walking. He's the He was the get it done man for the Father. In the beginning was the word. He was there in the beginning. And the word was with the Father. And the word was God. Remember, the Elohim, right? Because him and the Father are one working together of one spirit, the father accomplishing his will through his son. Son, I want you to go do this. I want you to go do that. I want to create this. I want to create that. Yes, father, I'm going to get it done. That's what happened in the beginning. But many ignorant Israelites believe that the father gets off, his, gets off of his throne, comes in, leaves the spirit realm, comes into the earthly realm, and does work. <laughs> they believe the father leaves his spiritual throne, comes into the earth and does work himself. Completely insane. You have no respect for the true majesty of our father, if that's what you, what you believe. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Absolutely. But it doesn't take away from the father's role. The father gave him commandment to get it done. Remember, like he says in, in the New Testament, he says, 
I follow my father's commandments, right? He says, uh, if you love me, keep my commandments the way I keep my father's commandments. He tells you that he only does what he's commanded to do. He does what the father commands him to do. So the father still gets his credit. He still gets his glory. He still gets his props. His props are never taken from him. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made in him was life and the life was the light of men see we were taken out of him the same way eve was taken out of adam and the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not he's talking about two different groups of people those that belong to him and those that do not those that belong to him were created and we were we are the light of the world listen to what it's saying he's speaking of light and darkness as people as entities, not as the light and darkness as we know it. Like you turn the light switch on and off and there's light and there, there's darkness. No. How can actual darkness comprehend anything? People, those with thinking faculties have the ability to comprehend and not comprehend. He's talking about people. So in the same way, you get many people who were created and they cannot comprehend. They can't understand the light which means they can't understand things having to do with Christ. Yahweh Shai, they can't understand things having to do with the Father. They can't understand us, those of us who are, who are in the light, because we are one with the Father, who is the light, and one with Yahweh Shai, who is the light. So we are the light with them who are the light. And so many can't understand what we're talking about when we're talking, when we're speaking, when we're teaching. Because we are one with the light and they are darkness and darkness comprehends it not. All right. Let's go to John chapter 14. And it says, and the word was made flesh. Christ, Yahweh Shai, the voice of God was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. All right. Let's go to Exodus chapter 23. Exodus chapter 23, verse 20. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. So again, Old Testament only Israelites will say, well, you know, Christ can't be real because he's taking the glory from the father. The father will not give his glory unto another. So they're saying that the father does everything himself because he is hypersensitive about delegating because he don't want anybody else to receive any glory or any props. So the father is getting off his throne to come do all of this work so that nobody else can receive his glory. Listen, he says, behold, I send an angel before thee. I'm sending somebody before thee. I'm sending someone. I'm delegating to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions. For my name is in him. The only one in all of creation in who, in who the father's name and power dwelt was Yahweh Shai, not the angels. The only one given the power to pardon transgressions outside of the Father, on behalf of the Father, was Yahweh Shai, not the angels. 22, and if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, you see what, he, see what just happened there? If you will obey his voice and do all that I speak, by obeying his voice is you obeying all that the Father speaks because the Father is speaking through him. He is the voice of God. He is the word of God. He is acting in the stead of the highest. Working and moving, acting on his behalf. Not the father getting off his throne to come do it himself. So he's telling you, he's sending them out. Is this 
Is his glory being stolen? Is he's giving his glory to another by delegating this way? He says, for mine angel shall go before thee and bring thee in unto the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. Listen, he's saying the angel was going to bring you in and then I'm going to cut you off. What does that mean? I'm going to use the angel to do this work for me. But because I am the king, I'm the majesty on high, I'm responsible for it, but I'm not physically doing it myself. I'm giving the command. It's me getting it done. Right? His glory is not being stolen or transferred at all. And he doesn't seem to be fearful of somebody else getting his glory. So he jumped off his throne to come do it himself. Crazy. All right, let's go to Exodus chapter 19. And many of you are not listening to the voice who he told you to obey because you think that you're showing the father reverence by, by, by railing against Christ, <laughs> the very one who he told you you better obey him because he will not pardon your transgressions for my name is in him. My name is in him him. My name is in him. My power is in him. I've given him my power, my authority. And you better obey him because obeying him is to obey me. You're going to obey me through him. All right. Exodus chapter 19. All right. So in the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai, all right, for they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness. And there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, thus shalt thou say unto the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So the father is delegating to Moses. But guess what? This is not the father speaking directly to Moses. This is King Yahushai. This is the hierarchy in work, all right, in, in progress. The father has delegated to Yahushai. And Yahweh Shai is delegating to Moses what he wants him to communicate to Israel. He didn't come out, crack the sky and come out there himself to come communicate. He delegated to Moses because he believes in delegation. He believes in hierarchy. He's not afraid of somebody having his glory. Right? He's delegating. But you said he doesn't delegate. You Old Testament only Israel says the father doesn't delegate. He does everything himself. If he does everything himself, why did he just come and speak directly to all of Israel himself? Why did he use an intercessor? Why did he use Moses to intercede on behalf of himself? Right? Why did he use Moses to be the go-between? Why did he do it? All right, let's go to Exodus chapter 3. Telling y'all the Old Testament only, boy. Y'all love the Old Testament so much, but you're not reading it. And if you're reading, you're not understanding it. That's for sure. All right. The burning bush. Exodus chapter three. Let's start at verse one. Now, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in the flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. Who appeared to him out of the bush? The angel of the Lord. It doesn't say an angel of the Lord. It says the angel, the messenger. 
who is the messenger? Christ, Yahweh Shai, the first begotten, right? The God who was with them in the beginning. The angel of the presence of the Lord. He who was the one walking in the garden with Adam and Eve. That very same one. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. All right. So we know this is not the father that appeared. All right. This is Yahweh Shai. This is Christ. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned, and when the loss, oops, stop. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Wait a minute. Who called unto him out of the midst of the bush? says God. But wait a minute. Up here it says the angel appeared unto him out of the midst of the bush. Now it says this angel is God. What? And he said, draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet. For the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moses is having a conversation with Yahweh, not the father. All right. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father. Wait a minute. Yahweh Shai says, he is the God of thy father, the God of, of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And so we know that he is God with the father, who is God. They are one. <laughs> they are one. It is not blasphemy to say that Yahweh Shai is God. He is not the Father, but he is God. He is one with the Father in the same way at the end, at the end of things, the Israel of God, who he brings into his family, we will be called God as well when he makes us one with himself. In the same way, Yahweh Shai can be referred to as God. The other nations of the earth will refer to us as God also. You need to read more intensively if you don't believe that or understand that, all right? And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. I am come down. You think the Father has left the spiritual realm, left his glorious kingdom to come down into the earth to deliver Israel? out of the hand of the Egyptians? No. So who is this doing it? The one who's, who says, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him. It's the angel of the Lord who also called himself God, who the scriptures call God. It is not the father. Y'all got to learn this because not understanding this is going to lead many of you to your death because you're going to be disrespecting Christ, our God, because in, in, in attempts and in your zeal for Father God, thinking that the Father God is pleased with you for disrespecting and hating his son when that's far from the truth. So again, that zeal that you have that's not according to knowledge is going to be the death of you. If you don't get this right, you will die. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his anger is killed but a little. All right? Better be careful. All right. So you see who is communicating with him, right? Verse 10. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh. It's talking to Moses. That thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Wait a minute. What did he say? He told Moses that Moses is going to bring his people, Israel, out of Egypt. Why didn't the father just bypass Yahweh, bypass Moses, come down into the earth all on his all of his own and then and just save us himself with his own hand well he did except that his hand is Yahweh Shai, his right hand man he's a spirit the father cannot come into this this earthly realm as a, as the 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 great spirit he needs avatars he has to come through someone you don't understand how this works <laughs> obviously you don't 
Obviously, you don't. All right, that's why Christ, our king, he had to put on flesh in order to come into this world because this world de demands flesh in order to be here. He couldn't come as a spirit. He had to put on flesh. The father is outside of time, outside of earth. He remained outside of the earth when Christ came here. The father didn't leave his throne, leave his throne uh, vacant while he came into the earth. He never leaves his throne vacant in order to come into the earth to come do his own works himself. What is wrong with you people? And Moses said unto God, who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, certainly I will be with thee. The, way, the same way the father is with Christ Yahweh Shai. This is Yahweh Shai telling Moses, I'm going to be with you. Pecking order, hierarchy pattern of things in heaven being shown to us on earth and earthly things. And this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of, of, Egypt, out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, the God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am, hath sent me unto you. All right, he is. That's how we refer to him. He says, I am. We say he is. In Hebrew, in Hebrew that would be Yahweh. He is. And God said, moreover unto Moses. And remember, this is Yahweh Shai speaking. But because he's, he has the, the power of attorney from the father. He's given the father's power and authority to act on his behalf in the earth. Right? He's he's telling you. You're going to tell, tell him that Yahweh has sent you. Again, Yahweh Shai giving glory unto the father, making sure they know it is the father who is responsible. That's who you need to be looking towards. The same way he did all through the New Testament, constantly pointing everybody to the Father. Why callest thou me good? There's only one good, and that's the Father. He constantly gave reverence to the Father and said, look to him. He made sure we never forgot who was the head, who was the, the majesty on high. And God said, moreover unto Moses, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. All right, let's go to Exodus chapter four. Moses given powers. Moses is given powers in the same way Yahweh Shai, when he was on the earth, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him. He was given powers so that he could make a believer out of everybody so that they would follow him. Moses is given power so that the Israelites would follow him. They would believe. All right. So the same way the father gave, gave uh, Christ powers, he gave Moses powers, delegation. I'm going to give you powers, Moses, so that people know that I have sent you, that you are coming in my name. That you are come because I have sent you. He said that the same way with Christ. I'm going to give you power so that everybody knows that you were sent for me. And like Christ said, and if you don't believe me, believe me for the very work's sake. Right? So Moses is given power, right? So that he can work on behalf of the Father. Now we're going to skip down. And he says, uh, let's go to, he says, and Moses said unto the Lord, oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, who hath made man's mouth or who maketh the dumb or deaf or the seen or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now, therefore, go. And I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou will send. So he's telling him, I'm going to put words in your mouth. I'm going to work through you. In the same way the father works through 
Yahweh Shai, Yahweh Shai was working through Moses and to teach us and them the, these patterns of things to come. Watch what happens next. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth. And the same, so listen, listen to what's being shown. And I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth and will teach you what ye shall do. So in the same way that the father sends Yahweh Shai and puts his words in Yahweh Shai's mouth, Yahweh Shai is coming and he is going to send Moses. He's going to put his words in Moses' mouth, but he's going to use Aaron to speak for Moses in the same way that Yahweh Shai speaks for the father. This is what's, what we've been shown. All right. Watch this. Don't believe me. Don't believe me. Just watch. And he shall be thy spokesman in the same way that Yahweh Shai is the spokesman of the father. All right. But let's continue. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people. And he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth. Listen. And thou shalt be to him instead of God. Did you see what just happened there? Moses is going to be like God in this instance, putting his words. He's going to be like the father and Christ delegating. Right? Um, you're going to be as God to Aaron. And Aaron is going to be like you to me. Aaron is going to be like what Yahweh Shai is to the father. And Moses, you're going to be like the father to him. This is what we're being shown here with this. But did you catch it? I bet you didn't catch it. All right. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 12. And finally, we're going to close out with this. Zechariah chapter 12. Let's come down to verse 8. In that day, in time prophecy, shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem and he that is feeble among them in that day shall be as David. Watch this. And the house of David shall be as God. You see that? This is the Old Testament. Old Testament only uh, Israelites. And the house of David shall be as God. They're going to be made as God. As the angel of the Lord before them. The angel of the Lord, Yahweh Shai. They're going to be made like Yahweh Shai. They're going to be made like Christ who is God. The Israelites who have the house of David are going to be made just like Yahweh Shai. God, one with the Father, one with the only begotten of the Father, aka God, because they're going to be of one spirit, one mind. They're going to be given power from on high. They're going to be, they're going to share the power God is going to endow them with his power, with his spirit, the same way he did Yahweh Shai. And in order for us to have faith that he would do this and that he could do this, he showed us that he could. He sent Yahweh Shai to be the example, to be the demonstration of what, we, what would happen to us in the end. He did it first with him. Again, for all you males out there, you men out there that are athletes, you ever play sports? You ever been sitting in practice or something and the coach wanted to demonstrate a move or a technique and he brought somebody up there who was great at the move or great at the technique and he used them to demo what he wanted you to do? That's what Yahweh Shai was to us. He was the father raising up a demo for us, an excellent demonstrator of what would be, of what he was going to do and accomplish with us. But again, only those who are the Israel of the Most High God can understand this because not all they who are of Israel are Israel. They are not all Israel who are of Israel, meaning not all of the bloodline of Israel are going to become the Israel of God. Many are going to perish in the way. Many are going to be left in gross darkness. They're not going to know. They're not going to be able to see, to hear, to understand. Make the heart of this people fat. 
Give them eyes that they shall not see, ears that they cannot hear, and a heart that they shall not understand, and shall convert, and I shall heal them because he doesn't want to. They are purposely left in the dark. And if you have made it this far and you are an Old Testament only Israelite, I would pray, I would beg for mercy and forgiveness and seek his truth and light with tears. Trust me, that's what I did. I began my walk as an Old Testament only Israelite. But he gave me a heart to continue to seek him. And one day I found myself in the shower thinking about him and saying to myself, it is very possible that there are because that there are spiritual things going on that I'm just left blind to. And if I'm just in the dark and you really do have a son, there really is a Christ. And I have been railing against them and I've been fighting against them and hating them and being disrespectful all this time. Please forgive me. And open up my understanding Allow me to see the light. Allow me to know better, to do better, to be better. And in that same moment, the spirit of God descended upon me, broke me down to my knees in the shower, and I wept like a baby because he showed me the truth. Then I sat down with my Bible, the same Bible I was reading every day. And guess what? I'm all, all of a sudden, I'm now able to see what was hidden to me before. It's like I picked up a new book. It was like the Mandela effect. Like, was this here the whole time? Wait a minute. They just wrote this. This wasn't here the whole time. How did I read this over and over and over again and couldn't see this before? So I know what's going on with you Old Testament only Israelites. I was there. You are reading the scriptures over and over and you can't see what's right there. I've been there. And I'm trying to tell you how I came out of the dark, how he brought me out. The same can happen for you. That's my hope, my prayer for Israel, that you can be saved, that you will be saved. With that said, let's give all praise, honor, and glory to the highest, to our Abba Yahweh, in the name of our beloved King, our Savior and Redeemer, Yahweh Shai, the Holy One of Israel. Grace, peace, and many blessings to the Israel of God. For those of you trying to get this, trying to understand, pray for knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, and that it might be delivered unto you and you can be brought out of the darkness. All right? So, again, be blessed, y'all. I'll see you guys on the next one, Lord willing, of course. Shalom.